call it what it fucking is. This is not about Muslims. It's not about Jews. It's not about other religious minorities. Yep. It's about Christians using the government for privileges because to them, religious freedom is religious privilege. Yep. And anytime their privileges are, are revoked, they see it as a violation of their religious freedom. Right. It's not. <laughs> and, and, and under any sane world – where the Supreme Court actually respected previous law, precedent. Pe precedent should mean something. Yeah. You know? Um, but with this Supreme Court, it just flat out doesn't. They don't care. Yeah. Um, They've got an ideological like, mission, and that's yes. what they'll do. They have an ideological mission, and they're going to make everything fit that ideological mission. They Hi and welcome to Red Reviews, the podcast where we talk about a variety of books with a Marxist and anarchist lens. And I'm here with Justin Clark, my co-host. Thanks for joining me, Justin. Thanks for having me, Corey. It's always great. We're doing two of these this week, although people might get the edited version later down the road, but we're doing for two sure. this week because we've both been <laughs> quite busy. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, very, very excited to be back. Um, we were going to be doing another book in the schedule this week, um, but I read this book recently and I think it's very prescient. Um, normally when we do these shows, I like to have them be ra relatively evergreen so that people can watch them five, 10 years down the road. My hope is that this one will be evergreen as well to a certain extent, because I think this is one of the big issues of our time. Um, we're going a little bit back to our secular activism roots and talking about the, the sort of separation of church and state. And how it's being absolutely eroded in the United States of America yeah. by a incredibly out of control, radicalized Supreme Court. And I don't think there's any better guide to that, and especially in relation to religious freedom, than Andrew Seidel's excellent book, American Crusade. Very cool. How the Supreme Court is weaponizing religious freedom. Nice. Um, for those who don't know, Andrew Seidel has been in the secular movement for a very, very long time. He's a constitutional attorney. Um, he works for the Freedom from Religion Foundation, the FFRF, which is a wonderful organization based out of Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and uh, I used to be a member. I've considered re-upping my membership, uh, but I haven't done it recently. Um, I won a scholarship through them years ago, actually writing about something that we'll be talking about tonight, one of these cool. Supreme Court cases. Um, and they're excellent. Um, for those who are unfamiliar with FFRF, maybe you know Dan Barker, who is involved, who's, been, who's, in, who's been involved in FFRF for a long time with his wife, Annie Laurie Gaylor. Um, and so Andrew Seidel has worked for FFRF. He also works for Americans United for Separation of Church and State, which is another wonderful organization. Um, and he is the previous author of a book called The Founding Myth, mm -hmm. um, which is an incredibly good book, too. It's a book where he essentially debunks the arguments of Christian nationalists. Right. Um, and he argues that um, that, you know, the the idea that sort of the founding fathers were sort of founding the United States of America explicitly upon Judeo-Christian values is not true that the concept of Judeo Christian values in and of itself is a bit of a nebulous one. It's a, it's a term that largely came out of post-World War II yeah. um, because if we called it explicitly Christian values, uh, it starts to sound not so great because it starts sounding a little fashy. So yep. they add the Judeo part in is like to throw a bone to those who have suffered the horrors <laughs> to of the cover Holocaust. cover up the fascists. <laughs> to cover up the fascists. Um and I think he makes a pretty darn convincing argument. I mean, in my study of American history over 20 plus years, uh, one thing I can tell you is that the founders were certainly not like atheists in any explicit sense, but they were certainly men of the Enlightenment and they were secular. And one right. of, I think, one of the, you can say a lot of bad things about the founders and they would all be true. But the one thing you can say that I think they did right was the idea of founding a government that was completely secular. Yeah. There is no – the word God does not appear in the U.S. Constitution. It also doesn't appear in the Declaration of Independence. Yeah. And the only times that religion is mentioned in the Constitution is to put prohibitions on it or protections for it. Yeah. So there's the banning of religious tests for public office, which is a part of the Constitution. And the other part is the, the First Amendment, 
Um, and the First Amendment, I think, is incredibly important. Um, and I think to give people some context, because I, I wasn't necessarily going to do this, but I, I think I am. So I think people need to actually know the text of the First Amendment. I think it's extremely relevant. For sure. So the First Amendment, <clears throat> probably arguably one of the most important pieces of sort of legal theory that has ever happened, at least in the West. And I think one that is an honorable one and one that we should continue to sort of support. And the First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. That is known as the Establishment Clause. Yeah. Remember that because that'll be important later. Or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That's the free exercise clause. That's yep. also important. Or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people to peaceably peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. It's a lot packed in there. Yep. But it's very relevant because that in and of itself is a legal doc, legal phrase that provides for the self-correcting mechanism to make society better. It's right. kind of built into the constitution, which is pretty damn cool when you think about it. Like, um, and because it's saying right out that like freedom of conscience is extremely important. It's a very, it, freedom of conscience is something that comes out of the enlightenment. Yeah. You know, the founders of America, you know, Hamilton, Madison, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, and many others all were students of history and students of the Enlightenment. And they knew that they wanted the United States to avoid the religious wars that had plagued Europe for centuries. Right. You know, Protestants versus Catholics or other different religious factions against another, all of them going against Jews or Muslims, like the Crusades, that religious violence is often caused specifically because governments are founded upon a religion. And their goal was, in order for us to avoid all of that, we're going to avoid religion altogether. It's a private matter. Religion is a private matter and it should be. Yeah. And that is, for most of American history, how this has been framed. Yeah. Um, and there's always been a battle in American history between those who have advocated for secularism, which again is not anti-religion. Right. I think people have this idea that secular means that you're non-religious. And that, sometimes that's true, but it doesn't also mean that you're anti-religious. Right. Yeah. There's a, uh, I think, um, some countries, they uh, some even some regions in Canada, use the idea of secularism to oppress religious minorities. Right, and that gives the idea of secularism a bad name in a broader sense. But yeah, it literally doesn't mean anti-religion. It just means neutral. <laughs> exactly, it's that you have that position of neutrality. That's a great word to use, because. Again, it's it's learning from history and recognizing that religion divides people. Yeah. And that in the polis, in the civic polity, in civic society, in civil society, whether it's the government or public goods as a whole, that they should be universal to all and exclusionary to none. Yeah. That's the principle. And for many, many decades, you know, the Supreme Court was good on this. You know, right. The U.S. Supreme Court was good on this. <laughs> and in start, especially in the 1950s and 60s, it was very good on this. You have a slew of cases that come out of the 1950s and 60s that reaffirm secularism in government. One of them is the Shemp case, which is which, um, you know, bans compulsory prayer in public schools. So what's really relevant about prayer in public schools is that you, uh, students are under no um, obligation to pray as a mandatory part of being involved in a public school. And now if you wish to pray, you can do that as a student. You're fine. Um, and administrators and teachers can also pray on their own time. What they cannot do, at least until now, what they couldn't do is they couldn't lead students in prayer in a public school. That was, that was you know, because for most of the, probably the first half of the 20th century or the first two thirds of the 20th century in the United States, the establishment clause of the First Amendment really mattered, which is that Congress shall make no law establishment for the establishment of religion. Like that right. was really important. Within the last 50 years or so, the court has largely changed and they could give a fuck about the, <laughs> the establishment clause at all. Yeah, that's and right. they are obsessed with the free exercise clause. Yeah. 
And so a lot of the cases that have come over the Supreme Court, especially over the last 10, 15 years, have been mostly about about free exercise of religion and how those can kind of play around Uh, and how those can how the free exercise of religion can then be twisted. Mm. Let me clarify that how the the freedom, the, the the free exercise clause of religion can then be twisted to provide religious privileges. Right. So there, the issue we run into in the United States, especially with Christian nationalism is that it sees anything as it sees sort of privileges as rights and it has no sense of responsibility to others because rights do come with responsibilities. They should, right? Yep. That's how that works. (laughs) That's how that works. Rights come with responsibilities. And, and fundamentally, you should follow what John Stuart Mill called the harm principle, which is you are free to do what you want so long as you don't harm others. That's, right. you know, and generally that's how we should build our society, especially in relationship to religion. So in the beginning of the book, Seidel talks about sort of, he has what he, he refers to as the three lines of the separation of church and state. Okay. The three main lines. And he uses them a lot in the book to describe how the Supreme Court has... Um, absolutely undermined and completely undermined these three sort of core tenets of First Amendment law that has been the case basically since the founding of the country. One of them is what he broadly calls action versus belief. So in the United States of America, in, in a free secular society like ours, or, you know, I'm going to put free in scare quotes here. Uh, in a secular society like ours, ideally, people are free to believe whatever they want. Yeah. They are free to believe whatever they want. They're free to say whatever they want. That's that's how that works. And we wouldn't necessarily want government to violate people's ability to believe what they want or to say what they want. Right. Unless it's spe- under specific circumstances and that relates into action. If your actions, if you have if you take actions based upon your beliefs, okay. which may violate the rights of others. Right then we have a problem. Yeah, and that sure. takes us to line number two, which is the rights of others. So it's the beliefs versus the rights of others. Again, if you are doing something, if you're acting upon something that harms others, yeah. then that is in violation of the separation of churches. Turns out that other people exist and have rights. <laughs> Bingo. It's not all about you. It's That's not right. all about you. And the third line is state and church. That you must maintain the wall of separation. This is the, the phrase wall of separation comes from Thomas Jefferson. It's, it's something he wrote in a letter to the Danbury Baptists. I think either post, I think in his post presidency or during his presidency, okay. basically laying out his essential view of, of how sep, how church state issues should be resolved in, in civil government. And he basically says it should be a wall of separation. And I agree with him. I think that it's that, you know, um, that that the wall of separation exists to protect the state, but it also exists to protect the church. Mm-hmm. Because you can imagine a situation where a specific, because this is the thing, right? We always make the point sometimes that like there's as many forms of Christianity as there are Christians. Yep. So what if, or as many different Muslims as there is, the different Islams as there are, forms of Islam as there are Muslims, you know? Right. That it's very – what happens if a very specific sect of a religion gets into power? Yeah. And they don't like your sect of religion. And they don't your like religion. your yeah. sect and they don't like your religion. Yeah. Um, that's a problem because then again, the breakdown of, of the civil government happens as a result. You can't, you can't meaningfully make a free and democratic society when one specific portion of that political system – has privilege over everyone else. Yeah. You're Which, supposed to be equal under the law. We're talking about r- Christianity and, and religion right now, but that applies to everything. <laughs> Absolutely. I would argue that that, I would argue that that, bl- that also applies to capitalism. Yeah. Because capitalism undermines democracy. Exactly. It does. Yeah. In fact, one of the uh, great jurists who actually did, who was one of the good ones, good justices who sat in the Supreme Court, Louis Brandeis, once said, we can either have a democracy or we can have wealth concentrated in the hands of a few. We cannot have both. Yeah. 
He's right. Exactly. Yep. Because the concentrations of wealth and providing privileges, whether they be religious or economic, undermine equality before the law. Yeah, that's right. And they do. Because if you have more money, then you can have the then you can pay for better lawyers, or you can you can buy political ads, that, or you can buy politicians. Yep. Tell with the ads, you can just buy the politicians, yep. right? And it completely undermines the system in and of itself. Yep. I realized I didn't have my light on. Now I do. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I look a little better now. And so these are you know so you have action versus belief, the rights of others, and state of church, state and church. You know, for a long time, this has been the way that we've thought about religion in the United States. Right. When I was in eighth grade, uh, I did a, pro a program in, in school called We the People. And okay. It was a program where you learned about the Constitution. Oh. And I was, I was put a part of the student group who had to learn about um, the First Amendment. Okay. Uh, and so um, this has been something of, of, a, of a passion of mine for 20 years. I, right. I, I very much care about the First Amendment. I think it's one of the very, very good things about the U.S. Constitution that if we were to completely upend the society and replace it with something else, it would be one of the one things we should keep. Right. One of the very few things we should keep is the First Amendment, specifically because it's extremely radical. People don't realize how radical and how unnecessary it is. Because if you have a society who provides specific privileges to people simply by virtue of what they believe, that is a society that will rot from within. That is yep, a society right. that will absolutely collapse. So how does this all relate to the Supreme Court? Well, if you look at the makeup of the Supreme Court today, it is a 6-3 conservative majority. Yep. And of the six conservatives that are on the, the court, Five of them were appointed by presidents who did not win the popular vote. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <laughs> so you have Alito <laughs> and Roberts who were appointed by George W. Bush. Yep. Again, didn't win the popular vote. Um, and some would argue he didn't win the popular yeah, vote. Yeah, barely the won the election at all. <laughs> barely won the election, you know. And the Supreme Court gave him the election yeah, in 2000. That's right. That's, right. Um, that's important. We'll come back to that. And then you have Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett. Those are the three Trump appointees. Again, not f appointed <laughs> from a president who did not win the popular vote. Yeah. And one of those arguably was stolen from Barack Obama. Yep. It was absolutely because stolen from it Barack was not, Obama. <laughs> it was absolutely stolen from Barack Obama. One, yeah. of those, one of those should be Merrick Garland, and it's not. Yeah, that's right. So Seidel talks about how the rise of the radical right in the United States. And one of the ways that the right has clued into how they can change the government, because they know, you know, white evangelical Christians are the minority. And it's a minority that's shrinking more and more and more and more every single year. Yep. The amount of people in this country who can are the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, they're atheists, agnostics, non-religious, spiritual, or just broadly the unchurched. Is is one of the largest demographics of religious demographics in the United States. Period. Yeah. It's a bigger demographic than all Muslims and all Jews. I think all Afri African Americans. You put all those together, it would still not be big enough compared to um, the the non-religious, the broadly non-religious or the unchurched. Yeah. So the the radical right know that they know that they're not going to get uh, they're not going to get this by winning elections. Right. They couldn't, you know, that, that if, if people actually voted in, in the United States, you know, most extreme right wingers would not win elections. They just right. wouldn't. Yeah. And they play upon, they play upon the ignorance of people, not that they're stupid, but the ignorance of people, that people don't know what's going on. Right. And, and that there's a dark network of very well-funded organizations that have led the Supreme Court to where it is. One of them is called the Federalist Society. Yep. The Federalist Society, which is run by a guy named Leonard Leo. And that's a very important name. He's arguably one of the most dangerous men in America because as the head of the Federalist Society, the, the majority of the Supreme Court are involved with the Federalist Society one way or another. And the Federalist yep. Society is a very right-wing, conservative, um, judicial activist group 
who have been instrumental in the confirmations of Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, Barrett, and pretty much like Alito and Roberts. Like all five of those were very much influenced by the um, by the Federalist Society. Yeah, if I recall, like they had a the Federalist Society had a list of like all the guys they or judges that they liked, and uh, yeah, like right wing presidents, Trump, and so on. Like they pick from that list. Yep. <laughs> they gave him the list, and and Trump gave them everything they wanted. If that, if you want to know, like, why do evangelicals like Trump so much? He's like this, like philanderer, and he cheated on his wife, and he's like really nasty, and he speaks uncouth. It's because he gave them what they wanted. Yeah, there were a lot of conservative presidents over the years who would promise them a lot, not give them too much. Yeah, Trump kind of gave them a lot. Yep. Um, you know, I think a quarter of all federal judges now are Trump appointees. Yeah. And that's yeah, Supreme Court and the appellate wire courts. with the judge appointments. Because there was a holdup. There was a bottleneck during the Obama administration, um, largely led by Mitch McConnell. Yeah. So, you know, all of these guys, you know, Alito, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, um, and uh, Barrett, all of them, um, they're all Catholics. They all come out of, um, you know, they all come out of like Catholic institutions. Um, Clarice Thomas, who was a George H. W. Bush appointee, mm-hmm. um, also a conservative. He's the, he's number six of the five, um, or he's number yeah he's he's the sixth that go along with the five that we just mentioned. Yeah. Um, he's also a Catholic. So there's this there's the you know the U.S. Supreme Court is practically basically it's only made up of Catholics and Jews. Now, right. There's not necessarily anything wrong with that, but it is interesting that in a country that's majority Protestant, that it's only Catholics <laughs> and Jews. In the yeah, that's right. Which is very interesting. But I always make the joke that the only reason why there's so many Catholics on the Supreme Court is because they're the only right wingers that read. Um, but, <laughs> but, um, but yeah. So let's go back to Bush v. Gore in 2000. Okay. So for those of you who weren't around. The election of 2000 was extremely contentious, and uh, it was really held up by the votes in Florida. And if a legitimate recount had been done in Florida, Al Gore, who was the Democratic candidate at the time, he was the vice president under Bill Clinton, he would have won the the state of Florida and he would have won the election. Um, But unfortunately, in the United States, we don't have like the direct election of presidents. We have the Electoral College. And so... The cases in Florida were a mess, and it went all the way to the House of Representatives who had to vote on who would be president, and they were locked, and they were sort of deadlocked. So then it went to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, in its decision in Bush v. Gore, awarded the presidency to George W. Bush. This is a coup that happened in real time, guys. Yeah. It, and it, was, it didn't have any violence, not at the outset at least, but it was basically a coup. And yeah. People need to know that, like all of the actors, it was like that uh, the Brooks Brothers riot to stop we have the, the Brooks counting. Brothers riot, of which Roger Stone was a part of. Yeah, um, a Trump ally who has a giant tattoo of Richard Nixon on his back. Um, but you also have like Catherine Harris, who is one of the election overseers yeah. in the state of Florida, who was the head of Bush for, Bush for Florida, right. and the governor of Florida at the time was his brother. Yeah. And then this fuckery happens again in 2004 in the state of Ohio when Ken Blackwell, who was the Secretary of State of Ohio, was also the head of Ohio for Bush. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, people always talk about like the, 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 the Republicans, like the Trumpers always talk about elections being stolen, right. like the 2020 election being stolen. There's a fairly actual credible argument that the election was stolen in 2004 by the Republicans. Yeah. It's so like every it's the Conyers report in 2004. <laughs> like it's it's always every accusation is a confession, exactly. right? Like, every like, accusation is a confession. So George W. Bush did not win the popular vote and was given the presidency by the Supreme Court, which had already pivoted to the right by that point. Yeah. And um, you know, the cons- and, and and Andrew Sandel makes a really good point in his book that for the most for the majority of American history the Supreme Court has been on the wrong side of it in the sense that it's an extremely conservative institution. Yeah. yeah. There's really only about a 10 or 20 year air period during the, the, the Earl Warren court of the 1950s mm. and sixties that it did a lot of, 
decent things. Right. You know, it was basically from like Brown v. Board in 54, which desegregated yeah. public schools, to Roe v. Wade, which legalized abortion in 1973. It's basically these 20 years where the Supreme Court was not completely and totally a conservative, awful institution. Yeah. And but that, yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, if you listen to the 5 4 podcast, mm-hmm. they definitely weren't perfect even during those times, right? Like it was just. God, just no. Not no. the shit that we have now, or that no. you guys have now. <laughs> no, yeah, it's it's pretty bad. And so Seidel makes this argument that like the beginning of what he calls the crusade is really 2000. Okay. Because once Bush wins the election, he then appoints two people to the court. That is uh, Roberts, mm-hmm. who takes over for William Rehnquist, who was the chief justice who died, and um, Samuel Alito. Um, and I think, I, I think he was the appointee for either Sandra Day O'Connor or David Souter. I can't remember, but kept both Roberts and Alito, very conservatives, very yeah. conservative, very conservative Catholics, especially Alito, right. who, um, very much believe in hard right social conservatism. They're, they're anti-gay, they're anti-gay in general, but they're especially anti-gay marriage. They're anti-abortion. And Roberts was too. Roberts has this reputation of being like the moderate. He isn't. But basically yeah. his whole argument is we're going to give the right everything they want, but we're going to do it slowly. Yeah. So that it doesn't erode the, the confidence in the court. Yeah. In the court. <laughs> yeah. We're going to do it over time. Of the, court. Yeah. the legitimacy yeah. of the court. Yeah. And – which that's all out the window now. I mean, Roberts yeah. is the chief justice, but essentially it's Alito's court now. Right. I mean, it's Alito or Thomas's court now because they kind of get to decide what they want. You know, it's it's weird where we live. Like, and and the thing about like John Roberts was a guy. Who, again, he was also involved in the Federalist Society. Like, he's also comes from the sort of very well funded right wing network of 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 judicial activism on the right. Yeah. yeah. His when during his Senate confirmation, because all Supreme Court justices have to be confirmed by both the Senate Judiciary and they have to be confirmed by the Senate as a whole. Right. Now, this wasn't really standard practice for most of American history. There didn't used to be much of a grilling process for Supreme Court justices. That really starts with Louis Brandeis. And and the reason it starts with him is because he was Jewish. Right. They grilled him because he was Jewish. He would have he was the first Jewish member of the Supreme Court. So they grilled him for that. Right. Was that like because they uh they had to they, like they were using their like, they were being anti Semitic and and acting yes. so we had uh dual allegiance kind of basically, yes. Yes. Yeah. Very much like they would do when Al Smith and John F. Kennedy ran for president because they were Catholics. Right, right. Same thing. Because United States, weirdly enough, there's like <laughs> six members of the Supreme Court, or yeah, it's basically six who are Catholics. Yeah, and yet we've only had two two Catholic presidents, right? You know, John F. Kennedy and Joe Biden. That's it. Yeah. So it's it's a very interesting thing. And I want to preface: I'm not like necessarily anti-Catholic. I'm just saying that like it's relevant <laughs> in a country that is primarily not Catholic that the majority of the Supreme Court is Catholic. Yeah. So I think that informs a lot of what the court does. In For terms sure. of its social conservatism, um, even though I think the majority of American Catholics are, in many respects, socially liberals. Yes, they're certainly yeah. more, and they're certainly more liberal than evangelicals. Yeah, it's an interesting dynamic because, like you say, like the far right, uh, the the people who vote for the the right wing politicians are Protestant evangelical uh, types, and yeah. then and then you got like the the. Supreme Court is Catholics, but most Catholics might like a lot of Catholics probably vote Democrat. <laughs> yes. Most Catholics vote Democrat and most Jews vote Democrat. You know? Um, you know, the only people who really vote mainline Republican most of the time are evangelical Protestants. Yeah. You know. It's a very, very strange dynamic you got. It's going an extremely on <laughs> strange dynamic, but it's one that's relevant because again, this gets to the heart of like why we should have a secular government because of these weird divisions and and yeah. possible you know tests of loyalty and this and that and the other. Sure. And so you have you have Roberts and Alito. Trump becomes president in 2017. Uh, 
Obama had nominated Merrick Garland for the Supreme Court when um, I can't remember if it was who retired. I think it was so John Paul Stevens. I think he retired. Okay. And or it was either he retired. I think he retired. And so then there was the replacement for him. Hmm. Um, and uh, it was going to be Merrick Garland. That was Obama's nominee. Yeah. And who was like, uh, he was like a, uh, a middle road fucking yes. offer too. Like he wasn't yes. like a, he was not, he was rabid not left Democrat. He wasn't this like rabid <laughs> left person. <laughs> yeah. You know, he was a center left liberal, yeah. you know, um, in many respects, he probably would have decided cases similar to justice Anthony Kennedy. Right. Um, but maybe a little bit less socially conservative than Kennedy was yeah. on yeah. some things sort of depends. But the, the the U.S. Senate held up Obama's nominee for like a year yep. or so, and then Trump wins the presidency, and then they automatically, within really within weeks, yep. they have his replacement. Uh, so Garland's out, and in comes Neil Gorsuch, who was Trump's first kick. Yeah, Neil Gorsuch, of course, is again a part of this, you know, Federalist Society extreme right wing network. Um, had d- decided very poorly on dis- on religious uh, on religious issues, specifically in relationship to to religious displays on public grounds. Right. There was some things that he had he had decided upon, I think, as a federal judge, um, and he decided poorly on them. Um, and I also want to rem- I also want to remind people that all three of Trump's nominees, all three of them. Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett, all three of them stood in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee and said that Roe v. Wade, which is the Supreme Court decision in 1973 that legalized abortion in the country, is settled law. Yeah. Now, that's a statement of fact, not necessarily a statement of what they believe. They did some kind of chicken shit. You know, it was some real chicken shit, like yeah. like uh, rhetoric there. Yeah. But all three of them basically said that, like, we're not going to overturn the the established law of the court. Right. Which turns out that they fucking lied because last year they did it. Yep. So, um, and everybody yeah. with a brain knew they were lying. Yes. <laughs> well, at the very <laughs> least they had chosen their words very carefully to not provide an actual answer, which is kind of yeah. what they did, yeah. which in and of itself is a form of lying. It's a lie by omission, right? Yeah. Cause you're not saying what you actually think. Like it blew me away. Like that, it wasn't that people didn't consider it just obvious that Barrett was not saying the true thing that she believed. No. <laughs> like, she lied <laughs> and, and she lied consistently. And, yeah. and that's, you know, or she was, or if she didn't lie, she sort of equivocated and gave, um, you know, very, you know, for lack of a better word, like I said earlier, chicken shit answers. Like they yeah. weren't afraid they, they they were too afraid to actually say what they thought because if they said what they actually thought, they would not be confirmed. That's right. But the yeah. Democrats and the Judiciary Committee would have absolutely torpedoed them, period. Yeah. And for good reason. They should have anyway. But- and they should have anyway. And some tried. I mean, one of the few senators who has been really good on this shit is Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island, who has been incredible on this. He's written a whole book about it, about how fucked up the court is and how and how it got fucked up by dark money. Because, like, one of the things is that, like, Kavanaugh had a ton of debt, like right. student debt, mortgage, things like that. Those were all wiped out right before he became Supreme Court justice. Hmm. I wonder how that <laughs> happened, right? <laughs> yeah. So you have Gorsuch, you have Kavanaugh, Brett Kavanaugh, which, by the way, he had also had credible allegations of sexual assault, which should have torpedoed him right away. Yeah. But the but but the courts but the American history is just following the script at this point because Clarence Thomas had also had a problem with that during his Senate confirmation, you know, thirty years before. Yeah. And he was 30, guilty too. <laughs> and he was guilty too, you know, of sexual harassment of Anita Hill. Yep. And and the senator who torpedoed her on the Democratic side more than anybody was Joe Biden. Yeah. It was never, ever really apologized for it yep. um, because Joe Biden's a how conservative How is he Democrat. the pick for the party again? Like, how did that happen? <laughs> it happened because they didn't want Bernie. Yeah. It that happened because nonsense. they didn't want Bernie and all of the other moderates sucked. Yeah. It was they did not want Bernie and they did not want Warren and all of the other people were not ready for prime time. 
So that was it. it. And it was also Obama calling everybody up and saying, drop out. And Joe's going to take it. Yeah. Joe's going to take it and we'll give you something in return. Like it's, it's, you know, I, I always, I always make the point that Obama got off his ass exactly twice during the <laughs> pandemic, during 2020. Right. One was to fuck over Bernie. Yeah. And the other one was to fuck over the NBA players during their protests. Oh for yeah. yeah. When they were, they were protesting and trying to organize and, and things like that. Yeah. And he basically told them to, to, to shut up and play. Obama basically only peeks his head up every once in a while to just say insanely right wing shit and then go away. Yeah, it's it's very very interesting. I I, I find it it's maddening. But anyway, For sure. But anyway, so you have Kavanaugh and his whole and I remember his confirmation like it was his whole confirmation hearings were a nightmare. Where he, you know, he basically like threatened the, threatened the people and he was like, "You're going to reap the whirlwind if you go after me and this kind of shit." Which I guess technically is right, considering how the court's been over the last few years. Right. But but it's really distressing that somebody could be this absolutely unhinged and unprofessional during a Senate hearing for the Supreme Court and still get it. Yeah. Which I think is sad. I think it's absolutely <laughs> pathetic. And then you have Barrett. And Barrett's the weirdest one of them all because she was the one who belongs to a weird handmaid's tale like cult before she became right. <laughs> it's like yeah. weird sort of Catholic subset cult that she was in. So um, yeah, I mean the people who have been confirmed by uh, Trump are religious fanatics. All of them are. And, and of the two Bush appointees, Roberts is a religious fanatic, but doesn't wear his heart on his sleeve, but Alito does. Mm -hmm. And that gets us really to what they've been up to over the last, I would say, probably 10 years, because this is not something that just started with the with the, the right. nominees on the Trump court. This is something that has been moving this way slowly over yeah. over the last 10, 15 years, you know. And so I'm just going to kind of rip through talking some of these main points and kind of talk about sure. um, how they affect her chase separation. The first one is Kim Davis. If people remember Kim Davis, she was Ugh. the county clerk in Kentucky who didn't want to provide marriage licenses to same-sex couples. Mm -hmm. um, her case is very instructive because eventually, um, you know, the Supreme Court would essentially decide with her that that you know, in terms of freedom of conscience and whatnot. Um, <sighs> then you have the masterpiece masterpiece cake shop versus Colorado Civil Rights Commission. This is the gay wedding cake case. Yeah. Where a gay couple had wanted to go in and get a cake. Not a gay the, cake. Just not any a gay cake. cake. <laughs> just a wedding cake. Just a wedding cake. Just a wedding cake. And the cake owner told them no because they were gay. Yeah. Because it violated his his religious beliefs. <clears throat> and this is clearly a violation of civil rights law. So yep. in the United States, really since the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, there's been this broad consideration in the legal in legal thought about what are called places of public accommodation. Right. And in places of public accommodation, which are hotels, restaurants, stores, shops of shops, various kinds, bakeries, <laughs> that you cannot discriminate against people based on their race, their color, their creed, their sexual orientation, and in some extent, gender identity. Yep. And you cannot discriminate against them on religious basis. Like you can't tell... Like if you if you ran a cake shop and um, and two Muslims came in and wanted a, wet, a wedding cake for their cake, you couldn't tell them no because they were Muslims. Yeah, that's right. against the law generally. And for most of the for most of the case law with this specific case, it was pretty clear that like they that he this guy violated the Civil Rights Act. Like it's like it's and, and not only the federal civil rights act but state civil rights laws which often sometimes tend to be stronger yeah. and in the case of of Colorado they were. And unfortunately, one of the big arguments that Supreme Court has used over the last 10 or so years to argue for sort of extreme right wing conservative Christian privilege instead of real religious freedom has been uh, what they call antipathy or antagonism towards religion. So the Colorado, so members of the Colorado Civil Rights Commission were quoted out of context in yep. in the Supreme Court opinion in this case, um, 
because they basic because they said the very some of these members of the civil, Colorado Civil Rights Commission made the very clear point that um, you cannot use religion to discriminate against other people. That's wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, Go figure, hey. <laughs> and somehow this was with this was judged as being anti anti um, antagonistic towards it was antagonistic towards yeah. religion, right? Which again, this isn't in the law. Like, there's nothing in the like you know it doesn't say Congress shall make no law with respect to antagonizing a religion. Like there's, right. it's not, there's nothing in the first amendment. This is anything about any of this. Yeah. It's just this sort of thing they kind of came up with to justify what they did. So the Supreme court ultimately ruled in favor of the cake baker. Um, so this is, you can see, like, if you imagine the wall of separation between two states, it's big, b- big, beautiful wall. It's a good wall, not a bad wall, but an actual <laughs> metaphorically good wall. Yeah. And it's just getting chipped at bit by bit by bit by bit until eventually you get a hole in it. And then you can start really going through. Yeah. Then you have in an earlier case, you have an employment division v. Smith. This is an earlier case. This case involved two men who worked for a drug rehabilitation facility who had taken some form of peyote during a religious celebration and were subsequently terminated as a result because you can't use drugs if you're working for a drug rehab clinic. Okay. Um, that was their rules as a drug rehab clinic, as their employer. Now they weren't arguing that their their termination was unfair. What they argued for was that they wished that 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 it was discriminatory to to um to uh, fire them, but it was equally discriminatory not to provide them with unemployment insurance, which is what they were really arguing, these two mm-hmm. two guys, Smith and okay. one other guy. But Smith's name's on the case. This goes all the way to the Supreme Court. Now, this is an example of the Supreme Court doing the right thing in sort of laying out and saying, look, you cannot discriminate against a person's private religious actions. Right. And that's what, you know, those the, in during a religious ceremony where you're using these substances, it's a private religious ceremony. It's not on work time. It's not during work hours. They weren't cannot, high at work. <laughs> they weren't high at work. You can discriminate against them for that, for their own private religious um, exercise. This is a good example of the Supreme Court kind of doing the right thing. Yeah. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. this case leads to the passage of the 1993 Religious Freedom Restoration Act by the federal government. Right. Now, I want to remember, I want to remind people that the RIFRA or the Religious Freedom Restoration Act was done with good intentions. It actually was. One of the big senators who was the co-sponsor for it was Ted Kennedy. It was signed. It was done by a Democratic Congress and signed by a Democratic President, Bill Clinton. Yeah, yeah. And the whole point was to reaffirm people's right to free exercise. That was the point of RIFRA. The problem is the language of RIFRA was so broad it was like trying to – it was like nailing in a hammer with like a sledge. It was like trying to ha- put in a nail with a sledgehammer. Yeah. And in doing so, you open up the fucking floodgates because RIFRA was passed before the sort of radical right took over Washington. It was two years before Republicans would take back Congress and it's you know a few years and it's a decade, a little, a little under a decade before Judge W. Bush would become president. So you have the rise of the religious right, and they're starting to now use the Religious Freedom Restoration Act to their advantage. I personally think that the Religious Freedom Restoration Act was a terrible fucking idea. Right. We already have broad legal protections for people's religious beliefs. It's called the First Amendment. Yeah, it was unnecessary. It was unnecessary. And in some respects, you can make the argument that RIFRA was unconstitutional because it's, it's Congress making a law with establishment of religion. Yeah, that's right. Like you like it's defining it's the federal government defining what is and isn't religion and what gets protect what religions get protections <clears throat> and which ones don't. The government shouldn't be in the religion business. It just yeah. shouldn't. That's yeah. what the first amendment's all about. And unfortunately, the problem is is that the Religious Freedom Restoration Act which was passed to protect private religious um, uh, exercises was then used to protect public Christian privilege. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And and it's been, I think, disastrous ever since. And states have used, have passed state laws, state referral laws, like Indiana had one that, that was passed about eight years ago during during Mike Pence's governorship that was very con- controversial and terrible in all of the ways you can imagine. So 
It only gets worse. Um, so now let's talk about the one that I've written about and, and one that I probably know the most out of all of these cases, which is the Hobby Lobby case. Uh, um, yeah. This is Burwell v. Hobby Lobby stores. This is the birth control case. Hey. So Hobby Lobby is a company that's run by the Greens. They're very conservative evangelical Christians. Um, and the Affordable Care Act, or you know, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act 2010, also known as the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, right. provided um, in it preventative coverage for preventative services. And one of those preventative services was birth control. Yep. So under the Affordable Care Act, women could receive, or people with uteruses, um, could receive birth control for free, yep. they, they, for free of charge. Hobby Lobby objected to this. Because they love with, people getting pregnant without, you know, planning. Without, yeah, <laughs> without planning, right? And again, they cited their religious beliefs as an example. Now. Which is fucking nonsense. But. Corey, I have a quick question for you. <laughs> and, and I think this is a fairly easy question. Does a corporation have religious beliefs? It does not. <laughs> exactly. So why do corporations <laughs> exist? The corporations exist to distribute liability away from the founders. Yeah. You sometimes it can be incorporated as an as an incorporation or a limited liability corporation like an LLC, right? Corporations exist to take care of things that individuals may not want to do and give them a buffer between their own personal lives and what the corporation has to do in effect with the law. That's but the wait. way it should be seen. <laughs> but, but wait. wait. <laughs> so in the Citizens United case, um, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, money equals speech, yeah. which in effect means that corporations, I mean, under the federal government and under the established case law, and this goes all the way back to like Lochner v. New York, this is like late 19th century, like f fucking Gilded Age shit, that basically corporations are people. Yeah. They're seen as persons. And Locking in some respects, nonsense. in the United States, yeah. and in, I know, and in some respects, corporations have more rights in the United States than living, breathing, oh, feeling, sure. thinking human beings. For sure. Absolutely. And that was pretty <laughs> much how the Supreme Court ruled in this case. So um, it goes all the way to the Supreme Court, um, and the Supreme Court rules in favor of Hobby Lobby, saying mm -hmm. that a corporation, not a person, but a corporation has religious beliefs and that those that corporation's religious beliefs can be violated by specific forms of compulsory birth control, which, which, by the way, the Greens who ran Hobby Lobby believed that the that the birth control that was provided on the Affordable Care Act were, quote unquote, abortifacients, meaning that they were drugs that which caused they abortion, were abs which they not. absolutely <laughs> were not. They were contraceptive. They were contraceptive medications, meaning that they prevented pregnancy. They did not terminate a pregnancy. But again, when it comes to religion, we're in a what I like to call a fact-free zone. Yep. Facts okay. do not matter with religion. That's why it's religion. And so because they it was their deeply held religious belief that the drugs, which weren't abortifacients, are in fact abortifacients. And it violates their deeply held religious beliefs, despite the fact that the Greens are not the corporation. Yep. Then the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Hobby Lobby. I wrote about this back in 2014 when this decision was made. Uh, I wrote an It's editorial. a fucking gibberish decision is what it it's is. It's an absolutely <laughs> garbage decision. It's one of the few times in my life that I've read the Supreme Court majority opinion and I read the dissent. The dissent was written by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And it's great. Yeah, I have my own criticism of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but on this specific thing, her dissent was fantastic because she laid out that basically there's an enormous difference between private religious beliefs of individuals and extending those beliefs to corporations and the havoc that that can wreak, can can sort of the havoc that that can wrought on the whole system of yeah. government yeah. and the whole system of society in general. Um, you can really make the argument here, like if you're pro-capitalist, which I'm not, but if you were, you could kind of make the argument that this is shitty for capitalism. Yeah, I can because, see that. Because it's going to ultimately lend itself towards capitalism being crappier than it would be otherwise. So for example, under the Hobby Lobby decision, corporations can basically say, oh, I'm dumping this toxic waste into the river because 
believing in it being toxic to others is something I don't believe. And that's a deeply held that's religious right. belief. What yeah. are you going to tell me now? Yeah, that's right. It's broadening out what is defined as a deeply held religious belief. Yeah. It's a huge it, problem. <laughs> yeah. Because, because they applied like even one, I mean, the anti-abortion argument is a religious one, but even that seems like it had, it had to be a stretch to me. Yes. But then the contraception one is even farther of a stretch. Yes. <laughs> because it requires, it literally requires the law to deny reality. Yeah. Yeah. Like it, it's, it's the facts literally do not matter. And that's the part that's like, I think that frustrates me to no end about these cases. And it's, and this is where you've seen the shift in the Supreme Court away from the establishment clause to the free exercise clause. We are broadening out that free exercise clause to basically mean any privileges that the government can provide religious people. Uh, specifically Christians. Specifically Christians. Because let's be real about this, right? Yeah. It's about Christians. Yeah. Like, you know, the moment that other religious minorities start following the heels of these decisions, you're going to see the same Christians who argued for these things being good, not being good for those people. Yeah, that's right. Because they're Muslims or they're Jews or they're Satanists or something else. Yep. It's it's really interesting how they can't see the privilege part when it benefits them, but they can see the privilege part when it benefits somebody else that they don't like. Yeah. Yep. Um, asinine. Absolutely <laughs> asinine. <laughs> yeah. It's like – and the thing is like – and I said this 10 years ago, nearly 10 years ago, and I'll say it again. The Hobby Lobby case – was going to open up the floodgates for awful decisions down the road. And I was right. For sure. And anybody, I mean, fucking Ray Charles could have seen that. I yep. mean, like it's, it's yep. like, it's anybody could see this yep. because every time with a lot of these cases, they always say, well, it's very limited. It means this very specific thing. And that's what the, the opinion, the majority opinion said about Hobby Lobby. But that then it was, they but can, that's bullshit. <laughs> yeah. That's all bullshit because here's the thing. And this is the thing that's important here. And this is where I'm going to take off my like, you know, fucking schoolhouse rock hat, which I've had on for most of the evening and put back on my fucking socialist hat and say, look, the Supreme Court is a shitty bourgeois institution that has too much fucking power. Yeah. And even under the U.S. Constitution, it was never supposed to have the power it has. Right. Right. It's usurped it outside of congressional authority, which Congress is supposed to regulate the court, not the other way around. But you can't expect much out of a bourgeois system like this. Right. Yeah. Because we're just talking about how they're eroding religious freedom. They're also eroding the, the uh, environmental law. They're also, they're also eroding corporate law. Yeah. They're also eroding they're, – they're, they're going to decide in a case on whether or not the federal government can actually ta tax wealthy people – like it's all of this is all <laughs> terrible shit. Like it's, it's bad. It's bad, 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 bad. Oh my God. And, but this is what happens because the court is political. There was this fiction, this yeah. absolute bullshit fiction that people believe for years. And it's so stupid. I can't imagine people, any, but anybody would fucking believe this, that the court was an apolitical institution. Yeah. That's but, bullshit. Uh, it never was. Yeah, it's right. always a political institution. The Every decision of, that's made in a society like this that affects people is a political decision, no matter yes. what you fucking imagine. Like, <laughs> and we have to get over this. This is what liberals have to get over. You know, there's no such so thing as not a political decision. <laughs> exactly. Like, you're, like liberals are so obsessed with like maintaining norms and fuck that. Like, yeah. we are living in very abnormal times. Yeah. That's let's right. not. Let's how how about the solutions be abnormal? Yeah. Like expanding the court which is which is Seidel's solution he's like the only way you're going to get the court back to some semblance of reality and sanity is by expanding the court but that can only be done by congress yeah so congress would have to pass a law in order to do it i don't expect democrats to ever do this no if you look at all of the ethics issues with the supreme court and how a good chunk of the, the justices are basically pals of billionaires yep. who themselves, those said billionaires, then have cases in front of the court. Of course. Which some of them, you know, also one of the members of the Supreme Court, Clarence Thomas, his wife was one of the architects of the January 6th insurrection. Yep. Full on QAnon. She's a fucking <laughs> QAnon psycho, <laughs> yep. you know? Yep. And so, and so there's like all of this stuff. 
And so there's all of these like networks. We've talked about the Federal Society. There's also the Alliance Defending Freedom and the Beckett Fund and all of these different like right wing judicial activist groups that are funded by dark money. Also, Clarence Thomas's billionaire uh, buddy is a Nazi. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, or at the very least, he has a very intense interest in Nazi memorabilia. Oh, he's a fucking Nazi. Let's just let's, let's just say Harlan Crow. Let's just be real about it. <laughs> so as we've seen over the last again, so if you think the Hobby Lobby case is, is, is the worst, oh, it gets worse. So the Supreme Court was terrible about COVID. Yep. Um, so there's a chapter in the book, Seidel lays out how a lot of the public health rulings in favor of keeping people socially distanced and masked up and all of this during the pandemic that was literally killing people, yeah. the Supreme Court on its shadow docket once, uh, you know, especially once Barrett was confirmed, um, they all ruled against these local public health measures, especially ones in California. So the thing is about during the pandemic, most of the super spreader events were at churches. They just were. And they were horrible, 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 horrible. And, uh, you know, and where one person could infect, could lead to the infections based on contract tracing to like dozens of people. I know there was a, a, a stage there where like you heard some liberals saying like that, oh, well, look at all, like all of the, the majority of deaths are Republicans from COVID. Yeah. And, and then, I mean, they would, they thought that that would give them some advantage, but everything's already been set up so that the fucking, the right will never, like, they'll never lose power. Right. Like <laughs> pretty much. I mean, and that's why they, they, they hijack the court. Yeah. Because arguably you can make the case that the court is the most powerful branch of government. Yeah. It's it unaccountable. Is. It's unaccountable to no one. It's accountable to no one. Yeah. Um, it's a lot, they're appointed for life they either have to die or resign to leave what the fuck is wrong with your country that you do these things <laughs> because the united states was not a, is not a democracy i want people to understand this this is so fucking important the united states is not a democracy it's not at least at least in canada we know it's a fake we live in a fake country so we don't have <laughs> so we because all have countries are fake countries right yeah, but it's fair. like but but like the United States is not a democracy. It's a yeah. republic. We are a democratic republic. There are all of these sort of checks and balances between the public and yeah. then with and then between the public and the government and then within different factions of the government. They were so worried about mob rule and like you know, yeah. losing power. But. Now, some of this can be good in the example of after the Dobbs decision that overturned Roe, there have been some states of the country that have legalized abortion permanently. right. right. So like that's federalism working towards better ends. Yeah. But for every state that does that, you have a state like mine who passed the first abortion ban in the country. Yeah. Literally within weeks of the decision. Because it was already ready, right? Because like, yeah. it was already ready to rock. Right. People had been wanting to do this for years. Yeah. So let's go through a few more of these and kind of right. talk about some of these cases. And then we'll talk about, we'll talk about Dobbs. <laughs> so we've got um, the American Legion versus the American Humanist Association. This is the Bladensburg Cross case. This was a cross that was on public land. Mm -hmm. um, and for years and years and years, they were trying to figure out a solution. And ultimately, what people really wanted was for the cross to go away. That was ideally what would happen. Um, but the Supreme Court said, no, it's totally constitutional for a religious icon of a specific religion to be on, a public, on, on public land. Right, because of... What uh, was it like historical significance? Yes, they basically made the historical <laughs> argument, which is an insult to religion. I would sure think so. Yeah. You know, also, it's kind of contradictory. So it's like it, part of the part of the the case is based upon deeply religious views and antipathy. So what is it? Is it antipathy to religion, which is why we we should keep it up, or is it historical value? Right. Because right. if it's merely historical value, then it doesn't actually have religious significance. And if it doesn't really have religious significance, it doesn't really have historical value, now does it? It's like, it's kind of this weird thing. And in and, and a generation before, it would have been very simple. Take the fucking cross down. Yeah. It would have been very simple. Yeah. Or at the very least, have that land be private land that's held in private hands. Yeah, It's that simple. The next one is uh, Trinity Lutheran Church versus Comer. This was one that was about grants for playgrounds for yes, religious organizations. I recall that, yeah. This one was pretty bad too. So basically, um, 
From the founding of the country, from the founding of the United States, it's been very clear, and it's clear in some state constitutions, specifically New Jersey, which is the state that this case comes from, mm-hmm. no public dollars should go to religious institutions. Yeah. Period. Period. That's how it's supposed to be. And in fact, one of probably the best pieces of American writing from the founding generation is something from founding father James Madison. He wrote something called A Memorial and Remonstrance, where he passionately defended the ban on any money going towards churches. There there had been a proposal to do like a five cent tax or like a five percent tax on okay. land for churches. And he said no. And he lays out very clearly why this is bad yeah. and how it undermines freedom of conscience and undermines public faith in institutions. Because that's the other thing too. Like if if, if institutions become like extremely right wing and like conservative Christian, people who aren't right wing conservative Christians, i.e. the majority of the fucking country, yeah. don't like it. And it kind of undermines the institutions. Yep. People start losing tr- people start losing trust in the system. They should. They kind of under <laughs> but, <you> know, <laughs> they should lose faith in the then system. Then they should. Yeah. For a variety of reasons, but especially for this. Yeah. So not only does this Supreme Court case go against the First Amendment, and it really goes against the guy who arguably wrote part of the First Amendment, which is James Madison. He's very clear about this. So is Jefferson. So are other founders. We're very clear about no public money for religious organizations, period. Yeah. Yeah. The argument that they used in this case was that they get these grants to keep kids safe on playgrounds. It was all about like we want to keep kids religious. safe. It's not religious. It's just- all about keeping kids safe. Yeah. So here's the thing. It's religion when they need it to be, and it's something else when they don't need it to be. But either way, the Supreme Court, the the, the right-wing psychos on the court know that this is about religion, so they're going to do it anyway. Yeah, that's right. So so you can make this quote-unquote secular argument all you want. They get to have their cake and eat it too. They get to have their cake and eat it too, basically. Um, So that was another terrible decision. Um, there were other decisions related to vouchers. So I, I am very much anti-voucher. I'm anti-private schools in general. Um, I don't think private schools should exist. Yep. Um, if I lived, if we lived in a world that would like function, that was good, we would ban private schooling. Every, every school would be a public school. <laughs> yep. Um, or at the very minimum, public money shouldn't go to private institutions, specifically private religious ones. Yeah. If you're going to have, if you're going to have them that absolutely government money shouldn't be going into them. And people should really, and, and, and Seidel does an excellent job in this book, laying out the really dark history of ch- of school privatization in the United States and how it's almost explicitly tied to racism. Oh, yeah. So after the Brown v. Board decision in 1954, which desegregated public schools in the United States, you saw the development of networks of private um, schools. Um, that were by and large religiously motivated, um, and then there were and there were ways that they tried to sort of massage the government into giving them money. Uh, and so this court has ruled time and again that vouchers are totally fine, um, especially um, now you could make the you could make the, an argument against vouchers not even on religious grounds, right? Right. You can make the argument that they undermine the public school system and they create a system that is essentially s- separate and unequal. Yeah, that's right. So you it have all the tax a revenue system. It creates a two tier system where all the white kids go to the private schools, which are paid for by public money, yeah. and all the black kids go to the public schools, which get less of that money, yeah. even though all of that public money should go to them. But it was because white people didn't want their kids going to school with black people. Because they're a, a private institution, then they get to they get to choose, pick and choose who goes there. Absolutely. So it's again, it's a good example of having their cake and eating it too. Yeah. Where you can discriminate against people all you want. Yeah. But you cannot get. But but and and you can discriminate all you want, and you can get public money. That's right. And there were a lot of people at that time who were very clear about the fact that they saw black people as inferior and they saw the separation of the races as a good thing. And that's what God intended. So there were deeply held religious beliefs that black people were not as human as white people and that white people shouldn't shouldn't be involved with black people and vice versa. So there's yeah. that. There's, there's your uh, – where and another see, this place is, where secularism is pretty important. <laughs> exactly. And this is where those con- – where those, those – 
principles con are in conflict, right? So you can believe whatever bat shittery you want to, especially whatever white supremacist or racist nonsense you want to believe in. The problem is, is when your, your beliefs then become actions and the actions violate the rights and, and privilege, not the privileges, but the rights and protections for others. Yep, that's right. Huge problem. Yep. The last couple of ones I'll say I'll talk about is um, Fulton v. Philadelphia, where the court ruled that a Catholic orphan, or, orphanage could discriminate against the same-sex foster parents. Um, but then the other two that he writes about in the book that hadn't been decided when the book came out, because the book came uh -huh. out last year, have been decided on, and I think they're very important. Right. One is Kennedy versus Bremerton School District. This legalizes school prayer again. Uh huh. So in the 1960s, you had the Shemp decision, which overturned mandatory prayer in public schools. Yep. Kennedy v. Bremerton School District basically brings it back. Um, uh, I think it was a guy who was, I think, let go for doing prayers with the local, I think, one of the sports teams. Very common. This happens all the time where the FFRF will go against. Um, they'll we try actually, to go. Yeah. Oh, we actually have a comment. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, let's not leave Bob Jones University from the conversation. <laughs> Without a doubt. So, so absolutely. So Bob Jones himself was a virulent racist. And when I was saying earlier about like how certain religious people believed that white supremacy was like a deeply held religious belief for them, I'm specifically talking about Bob Jones. I should have made that more clear. Bob Jones University is a good example of this because they were explicitly discriminatory yeah. against black people and against black students, but yet they, ex they expected to have public money. And they try to do some like wiggle room shit for a while where they like maybe let one African-American student in, but that student was part time. But it was like, see, we let a black person in. We're not completely racist. Right. Even though we are. Yes. Bob Jones University is a good example of this. Um, I think in any sane world, Bob Jones University wouldn't exist. Neither would Liberty University, the one that was set up by Jerry Falwell. I mean, most of these people are morons. I mean, you're going to get a better education from Hamburger University than you would from these places. Um, so school prayer is basically back on. And then the other one, the big one is Dobbs. The Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization. This is the one that overturned Roe. And, um, and all of these other cases all lead up to Roe in a lot of ways, especially the Hobby Lobby case, especially the COVID cases. A lot of these lead up to it where private religious beliefs are more important than the civil rights of everyone in a society. Right. So again, it's about Christian privilege because that's what it is. Let's call it what it fucking is. This is not about Muslims. It's not about Jews. It's not about other religious minorities. Yep. It's about Christians using the government for privileges because to them, religious freedom is religious privilege. Yep. And anytime their privileges are, are revoked, they see it as a violation of their religious freedom. Right. It's not. <laughs> and, and, and under any sane world where the Supreme Court actually respected previous law, precedent, pre precedent should mean something. Yeah. You know, um, but with this Supreme Court, it just flat out doesn't. They don't care. Yeah. Um, They've got an and, ideological mission and that's yes. what they'll do. They have an ideological mission and they're going to make everything fit that ideological mission. They yep. have a goal. Yep. And so what are the solutions? Well, I mean, we always talk, we talk about all the time. I mean, you can, you know, overthrow this rotten fucking system and place <laughs> something better. <laughs> yep. But in lieu of that, the one thing you could do, the one thing that should be done, and if Democrats actually had the c political will and courage to do it, it's also popular, by the way. This is the thing yep. that I just don't understand sometimes about Democrats. The people are on their side in a lot of shit. Mm -hmm. Why don't you just do it? You because know? their corporate donors don't like because it. Because their corporate donors <laughs> don't want it. Which yeah. goes to show you, again, the United States isn't much of a democracy. Now, is it? Yeah. Um, never was. It's like that meme, you know, the two astronauts are like with the gun. <laughs> yeah, United States right. wasn't a, wasn't isn't a democracy. Never was. Yeah, exactly. It's not. It's not. The founders were very explicit about that. They were they were a patrician, uh, paternalistic elitists. They thought the public were fucking stupid. Yep. Yeah. Hamilton refers to them as the great beast. I mean, like it's very clear. Yeah. They used a they, lot of rhetoric that sounded like 
power to the people type rhetoric. Mm-hmm. But but yeah, like ultimately the system they put in place is the opposite of that. Yeah. I mean, I've said this before, but the Constitution is in some respects a property document. It says a hell of a lot more about what you can and cannot own than what rights you have. Yeah. And the original draft of it said you could own people. So. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Essentially, you could own people. It never, it never said explicitly you could own people, but it's sort of implicitly by counting slaves as three fifths of a person. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's a whole debate in and of itself. But anyway, like, so one thing that, that can be done is that Congress can regulate the court, which is what they should do. You know, um, in my in my opinion, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett all stood in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee and lied about bro. They all lied. Yeah, and they either lied by omission or they lied by um equivocation it was basically and grandstanding they, they weren't honest yeah. they weren't explicitly honest. and in some grounds that could you could be held that, those are impeachable offenses like if i was in a democrats i would be holding impeachment proceedings on them for lying about their about roe i would hold impeachment proceedings on on clarence thomas for, for taking a fucking mir- bribes <laughs> for myriad of shit <laughs> for, yeah Conflict of interest, taking you bribes. Know, <laughs> I mean, all of these people are corrupt as sin. Yeah. And, you know, but all you're ever going to get out of the Democrats is a very strongly worded letter. All you're really going to get yeah. out of the Judiciary Chair- Chairman Dick Durbin. That's about all you're going to get. So we got, uh, I don't uh, like what you're doing. <laughs> it's right. Uh, some random geek says, again, America was never a democracy, but good luck trying to convince liberals of that. I know I have tried. It's crazy to me. It's crazy to me. I mean, it's because, and they even say it. I mean, that's the thing. They even say it. It's, it's because they were studying history and they knew, you know, the the only democracy that had ever really been tried was Athenian democracy that they knew of in the political West. We're not talking about like indigenous cultures that, you know, but like, but in the West you had the Athenian democracy, which had its own set of problems. But again, even Athenian democracy wasn't truly democratic because that's that system also had slaves. Yeah, and there was uh, like, yeah, I mean, not and, to get too much into it. <laughs> yes, and then like the Roman Republic also property had owners and, and citizens, yes. right? Like it was, citizens, yeah. <laughs> there were people who were considered a, a part or not a part of the polis. Yeah, and so yeah, <laughs> but the way that you get the way you can change some of this is to expand the court. Yep. So one of the arguments that I've heard has been um, that in the United States, there are 13 federal circuits within the federal circuit court system. Okay. As a result, there should be 13 on the court, one for each circuit. Sure. So you would add four. And those four ideally should all be people who are ostensibly left liberals, people who would balance the court. Right. So that you'd have like six or seven on the right. And six, and six or, or seven. seven on the left, and it would sort of balance out the court. Yeah. Ideally, that's what you do. America would still suck, but America would still <laughs> suck, and it would still be shit on like corporate law. Yeah, but it would be better, yeah. especially on free speech issues and separation church and state issues. It would yeah. be it would be much better on that stuff, um, and potentially some like some civil rights stuff, right? and some civil rights stuff that they would be better on it, right? Yeah. Like voting rights or gerrymandering or money in politics, they might be better on it. Yeah. The other solution, and I think maybe Ben Burgess wrote about this. I can't remember who wrote about this for Jacobin. But they great, wrote a great article basically saying abolish the Supreme Court, which is mm. like, I think you could abolish it. I yeah. mean, you could kill the Supreme Court. One of the ways that you could kill the Supreme Court is by constitutional amendment that kills the Supreme Court. And as all cases go through the federal judiciary, The federal circuit system, once it gets up to the highest appellate court, that's it. You don't go any higher than that. Yeah. Because there's something to be said about why is it that we should have nine unelected people, five of whom were chosen by people who also weren't elected by the people, making decisions for 300 million plus Americans. It's absurd. Yep. It's absurd. And, And yes, the Constitution is not great, but one of the things about it was initially the this the the most powerful branch was supposed to be Congress. It was supposed to be the legislative branch. It wasn't supposed to be the president. It wasn't supposed to be the courts. But they took over more authority over time. Some of that was for good reasons. Some of that was for bad reasons. But they did it. Yeah. And the Congress 
should reassert its role in regulating the court. They should stop seeing it as, oh, well, we're messing up the tradition. We're messing up like the system and we're, 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 we're upending norms. Like I said earlier, we're in very abnormal times. The court has been hijacked by an extreme right-wing conservative, by conservative right-wing Christian fanatics. It's been absolutely hijacked. It's completely and utterly illegitimate. It's, it's been delegitimized in the eyes of the public. Most people hold the Supreme Court, pun intended, in contempt. Yeah. I do. Yeah. It's, it's bullshit. And, you know, and yes, it's good that Biden got his nominee app- uh, appointed, you know, and confirmed, yep. Ketanji Brown Jackson. Yep. That's good. But at the end of the day, it's still not great because, you know, of the nine, like I said, of the nine, five were chosen by people doing the popular vote. Yeah. Yeah. Like so, you're looking at like a band aid over a fucking flood, right? <laughs> like it's, it's, it's one Supreme court ju- justice is, is not going to do the trick. And, and I'm going to be cynical here for a minute. I'm going to tell you why Democrats aren't going to do anything about it. <laughs> Democrats aren't going to do anything about it because it's good for them electorally. Mm. It's good for them for fundraising. It's good for them to win elections, but they're not going to really do anything about it. I mean, think about how they used Roe for years. There were many instances in American history over the last 40, 50 years where Democrats had control of the federal government that could have passed federal abortion law. Yep. Because one of the things that Alito did say in his majority opinion on Dobbs, which overturned Roe, and he's right, which is that Roe was always on flimsy legal ground. It always was. It was never. It was never solid because it, it was, was never. It was a quick, yeah, yeah. It was always a uh, like Roe was about privacy, right? Like so. Then yes, you, it was a it was a roundabout way to get there. Yes, it was an extension of the case Griswold v. Connecticut, which was another. That was the privacy case, and and they've already. I mean, if you listen to them, they're very clear about what they want to go after next. This is part of the reason why last year Democrats passed the Equality Act, mm-hmm. which legalized federally on the Congress through Congress marriage equality, same sex yeah. marriage and interracial marriage, because yeah. they knew the court would go after both of those next. Yep, that's right. So that's what I keep trying to tell people is all of the arguments you often hear from religious people about gay, gay folk or the LGBTQ community in large, just replace gay or transgender with black. Yep. Yep. And that was the argument a generation, three or four generations ago. It's basically they want to create a separate but unequal system. Yep. And they will do it if no one checks them. But the Democrats won't because then that would require the Democrats to actually do something. And they're too fucking busy giving money to Ukraine and, and Israel to do that. Yeah, that's right. So it's, you know, they're too busy, you know, because, you know, God forbid we should send countries we really don't have a fucking stake in, to be honest. Yep. Yep. Not really. Not, I mean, what are we doing over there? And and so it's 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 not going to happen because again, that would require Democrats to have to give up a, a fundraising tactic, a way to win elections. But they can't win on the economic stuff because they know they'll lose. That's why Republicans don't run an economic shit either. Yeah. If if Republicans ran on what they really believed, which is we're gonna we're gonna destroy the social safety net, we're gonna give huge <laughs> tax breaks to about twelve <laughs> fucking billionaires, which they do they every actually, time they get elected. <laughs> Which is what they do every time they're they get they, yeah it's what they do every time they're elected, but nobody fucking cares yeah. because culture both war. parties are culture war shit, <laughs> and that's and this and that's what this stuff is is this opens up the floodgates it's some of this is culture war stuff yeah that is serious because it's going to lead to wow. much stuff later on yeah that's right if it hasn't already i would i would say yeah like i think the culture war stuff is all serious because it is an attack on individual groups but that's literally like they're cynically using it to absolutely in their pure free market capitalist nonsense so that their buddies can make more more billions yes the, the neoliberal zombie will not will not die and so, like I said, like it's a very simple solution to the crisis, which is you you reform the court. You have to reform the court. And I think one of the ways you do that is, again, you could abolish it, let the federal appellate system take care of everything. Yep. Um, but you could also do term limits. Mm-hmm. You could do something that was Bernie's idea, which is kind of an interesting one, which is rotations. Oh, yeah. So like you're on the Supreme Court for like 10 years. 
And then you get off the court and you go back to like a fell appellate court for another 10 years and you come back like, like rotating judges around, which is, I could see the possibility of that, but I could also see that being a little chaotic. Yeah. It seems complicated, but. And I can also see how the right wing judicial activists and their dark money could then game that system to their advantage. Well, it's like you said, like uh, Trump appointed like hundreds of judges, right? Yes, like, <laughs> literally hundreds. <laughs> so, um, you know, there were more judges a- a- appointed and confirmed during Trump's four years than all of Obama's eight. Yeah. So if you just so, if you're rolling yeah. them in and out like of the Supreme Court, like you're still getting the same yeah. ideological. You're still getting. The, yeah, it's you're getting the still. Yeah, it's it's you're not changing it that much. Yeah. So, you know, if I were a liberal and I'm not, but if I were a liberal, what I would do is you would build institutions of what John Kenneth Galbraith called countervailing power. You have to create institutions to fight back against this right wing onslaught. But it just seems to me like there aren't very many people talking about it. Yeah. There was a lot of people fucking talking about it with the Dobbs decision, but then that kind of died down and the news cycle was kind of taken over by something else. Right. But yeah, I mean, I think it's it's the ability to regulate our environment to fight against climate change. That could, you know, they've already gutted a lot of the EPA, this awful court. Yep. Clean Air and Water Acts, you could regulate taxes. They're going to fuck us over on that one. You know, it's, you know, every once in a while, this awful court will be slightly decent on something. And the only reason that happens is because Roberts lets it happen so that he can maintain his legitimacy of the court. But spoiler alert, the court doesn't have any legitimacy anymore. Not for most people. <laughs> yeah. Justin, if you're a liberal, you would you would have said, it's too hard to change the system, so we won't even try, as one liberal said about the Electoral College. That's from Sam Moore Geek. Yeah. And, yeah. And I mean, that's such a stupid argument too. I agree with you. I mean, I think it's silliness because, you know, I mean, these are also the same people that be like, well – I know Plessy v. Ferguson wasn't great, but I know it's separate but equal, but at least they're still equal, right? Like it's – gotta. So we shouldn't really change anything because at least it's equal in theory. You got to change the like system from yeah. inside. You gotta- yeah, you got to do it from within. <laughs> so I, I really feel like you know this is – if we were to throw the constitution out and start over, this is the one thing that we would change, which is that the Supreme Court would be made up of like, I don't know. Uh, you could do like 13 for the 13 circuits, sure. you do 15, um, that you could do term limits, Yep. Um, stronger ethics rules. So you could do those too. Like yeah. if the judiciary committee actually gave a shit, um, they would start doing way more ethics investigations. Yeah. People. But you'd yeah. have to, like you say, you'd have to uh, make them accountable, make them limited, pack the court and like actually c- have rules in place that they, so yeah. that they have to follow. We actually have to pass laws to make this work because so much of the, this is the other thing too. So much of American government is predicated on tradition. A lot of stuff that's never written down. This is something my wife, Gailey always talks about. She's like, why is it all these damn traditions? And of course, you know, and conventions, you know, yep. you, you need to make them laws because if you, I mean, this is the thing about America, right? If somebody sees a loophole, they will barrel right through that motherfucker. And they've done it for years. That's the American mindset. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. There it is. Comment? Yeah. Uh, Susan Turpin says, tradition is just peer pressure from dead people. <laughs> yes. Yes, <laughs> yeah. it is. That's right. Absolutely. And they taught us our whole lives to resist peer yeah. pressure. So. <laughs> yes. That's pretty much what precedent is, too, in the legal system. I mean, it's basically just, you know, it's – it's. Um, it's uh, sort of, you know, it is sort of consent by the dead. Um, but yeah. that's the issue, right? You know, but that's the problem. I mean, it's like, you know, um, you know, I mean, Gore Vidal always made this great point. He's like, you know, John Adams once said that we are a nation of laws and not of men. But unfortunately, that has resulted in the United States having more lawyers than any country on earth. <laughs> and he's right. Yeah, uh, Susan Turpin says, Dare taught me how to resist peer pressure, damn it. <laughs> oh, of course, absolutely. It's very much how those abstinence-only cards I signed after the quote-unquote sex education I received in my rural high school, That's right. very much I pers- dissuaded me from having sex. That's right. Of course, of course. Trust me on that. Yeah, it's absurd. I mean, I think that um, I try to be – I'm a lot more tolerant today of religion than I used to be and I think those are all good things. But yeah. I will say that 
um, we should never be tolerant of religious privilege and bigotry. And that's what these people are propagating. Yep. Okay. Um, and if you want to, and if people want to know, you know, why I'm not religious, a lot of this is the reason why I think religion divides people. I don't think it unites people more than it divides people, which is part of the reason why we should have a secular society where people can believe what they want. So long as they don't violate the rights of others, because, um, Trying to build a system upon one religion or the other is always going to lead to terrible, terrible things. Yeah, that's and right. if anybody paid attention to Israel in the last few weeks, you can see why building a government upon some kind of religious um, exceptionalism, precedent, yeah. bad, exceptionalism is really bad. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, so yeah, so that's American Crusade. They are crusaders. They see themselves as crusaders. Yep. Um, people should know who they are. You know, um, we've just scratched the surface, but yeah, if you want to learn more, definitely read Andrew Seidel's book. Um, you could also check out Sheldon Whitehouse's book about the right wing sort of co-option of the court and the dark money that's done it or read yeah. anything about Leonard Leo. I mean, this is a guy people should know. Yeah. And, uh, I, I, there's, there's lots of really good books about how the right has just had a, a decades long project to, to take oh, over. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yes. And this is one, this book is one of a big amount of literature on the subject, um, like Democracy in Chains or Dark Money by Jane Mayer or other books like um, Democracy, uh, Dollarocracy by John Nichols and, and Bob McChesney. Um, they've all written about this. And ultimately, what does it come down to? The reason the right got to do everything that they wanted to is because they had un unlimited money to do it. Yep. And if you have stronger laws for what people did with their money, because money's not speech and corporations aren't people, um, <laughs> maybe it's bad. It always comes back to money. Sorry about okay. you. Yeah. But it does. All right. What are we covering next time? So I, uh, I oh, yeah. I literally it kind of like flew out my brain and then it came <laughs> right back. So the book we're doing next time is the book we were going to do tonight, but I wanted to do this book beforehand. Mm -hmm. uh, next time. Um, we're going to be doing a book called Road to Nowhere by Paris Marx. Very good. Um, Paris Marx is great. Um, I have host, actually uh, the, read about half of this book. <laughs> it's a good one. I'm about halfway through it myself. It's an excellent book. Um, and we're going to talk about transportation and how mm. big tech – we talked about with Checkpoint Capitalist, we talked about how big tech is ruining the, the arts. Um, big tech is also going to ruin transport. Yeah. in the United States and broadly around the world. So we're going to talk about Tesla. We're going to talk about dr driverless cars. We're going to talk about cars as a broader problem in yeah. general. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think that'll be, a, I think, a really interesting conversation. For sure. All right. Oh, where can people find you? <laughs> people can find me at my website, justinclark.org, right down there. Very cool. That's where I have every episode of the podcast as well as my writings. Um, my newest article uh, is out in the Truth Seekers 150th anniversary issue. Um, so go check that out or reach out to me and you can read it there. Um, a lot of my other writing for work is done at the Indiana History Blog, which is run by the Indiana Historical Bureau. Um, and also you can follow me on social media. I'm at Justin Clark PH. PH stands for public history. I'm on Instagram. I'm on threads and I'm on blue sky, but I need to get more active on those <laughs> other two. I'm mostly active on Instagram, just forewarned. Um, and then also, as I always say at the end, um, definitely support our work on Patreon. Corey works really hard on these and, and provides a really interesting forum for people to come together and talk about some really interesting things. So I definitely support the skeptical leftist on Patreon. I was just complaining before the show that uh, I've been spending my whole day looking on AI image creators to try and create the next thumbnail and how stupid these fucking things are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're not they're not they're not as artificial as you think. They're not as intelligent as you think. That's right. But. It's kind of nonsense. <laughs> I don't think artists have much to worry about at this point. Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Yeah. But yeah. So, uh, yeah. And if you like what we're doing here, make sure to check out the back catalog. And, uh, if you like interviews with people, check out the most recent interview with Margaret Killjoy I just released. So, yeah, that's going to be an interesting one. I'm going to check out for sure. And also, you know, I'm going to do the other thing. You know, smash that like button. That's right. You know, put a comment, <laughs> subscribe to the channel. 
on YouTube. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Yep. Um, and uh, follow us. I think on Facebook. You, I think you post stuff on Facebook. Yep. I've. I'm on all the social medias at skeptical leftist. So, <laughs> okay, cool. And I'm on all the social medias at Justin Clark pH. So, um, and, uh, yeah, so, um, definitely do that. Um, because that helps the algorithm. And then hopefully, you know, my goal is for one of these bad boys to like really go viral. That would be cool. That would be really, really good. Yeah. Um, smash but, that yeah. like button. Better, better <laughs> smash that like button, bro. <laughs> Right. It's like that YouTube speak, but you know how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Thanks everybody for watching the live stream. And thank you, Justin, again for joining me. And uh, oh, thank you so much. And thank you for those who watched and, and provided some great comments and questions. I'll see you again next time. All right. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching or listening. Uh, remember to share this show with your friends and on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it. And it helps me keep the internet and power on. Thanks to my top patrons, Some Random Geek, Damien Marie at Hope, Justin Clark, Christopher Taylor, Dan F. Smith, and Lisa Glass. And thank you to my new patrons. You can stay tuned for the list of patrons at the end to see your name listed. If you aren't a patron and want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can send a one-time donation to buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. These days, I also have a Substack and a Ghost where you can subscribe for free or you can donate per month. And lastly, you can get a paid subscription on Spotify that will give you the same access to bonus content and extra long episodes. If you can't contribute financially, then a like on YouTube or a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check out the show notes for links to all my stuff or check out my website, skepticalleftist.com. That's where you can find all of my social media spaces and communities, as well as the other shows that I do. You can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening or watching. Make sure to leave a comment on the video or on my website. Join your local org, print off some posters or pamphlets, and spread the propaganda. Also, make sure to stick around for a clip from this episode's post-show chat between me and Justin. listening to a podcast and someone mentioned that like covid is like america's chernobyl and it's like i think that's a really good point because like the chernobyl the chernobyl disaster was kind of like this big glaring moment where it's like oh the soviet union really is falling apart like things aren't going very well and you could kind of say the same thing about covid that like the most amount of hospitalizations the most amount of deaths like we handled covid very badly and yep. uh, and you can make the argument that like the United States will never really recover from COVID. Well, you got to acknowledge that it exists, <laughs> right?